Kalkadosh, I wanted to share with you a beautiful idea on this week's parasha, which I think is the secret to our emunah and our belief in a Kadosh Baruch Hu and the proper perspective that we're going to have. Not every single thing that happens in life, we understand. Especially now we could relate to this, especially with the corona and the virus and how everything is working out. Everyone starts saying, what's going on? People are living in fear. We can't live normally, whether it's even the religious aspect of life, whether it's in the Batekinesiot, whether it's the social aspect of life, whether it's mingling, parties, nothing's the same, whether it's even grocery shopping and everything else that we do in life, everything just became upside down. And we ask ourselves, how do we understand what's going on? What exactly is happening? And Chachamim come and they say that even though it's very weird and we don't understand, the exact same thing happened during Purim. What happened exactly? Let's analyze. We just came out of the Chag of Purim and let's see what happens. Whether it was at the beginning when Achashverosh comes and his claim to fame was his wife. It's true, he had a lot of money, but a big claim was that he was married to the princess. She was the great granddaughter of, of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babel. And all of a sudden he comes and he kills her. Why? Because he gets so upset, he gets a little bit high, he drinks too much, and then he loses it. Or whether it is afterwards that they come and they bring in Esther. And Esther is as if, say, captured. And she's taken to the house of Achashverosh, and then she becomes the queen. Or whether it is with the Haman becoming great, or his decrees. If we would come and, and just going to dissect, take apart just for one moment, piece by piece, and try to understand what is going on, we're clueless. We don't understand what's happening. And we would say to Hashem, why? What's going on? What's happening exactly? How does it make sense? However, though, we do know that every single thing that happens in this world, there is a purpose. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu is there and he's doing it purposely in order for us to grow and in order to help us out. And that's why and they say that this is the reason why, right? The Khatam Sofer actually explains in this week's parasha that he says the pasuk, et ufanai lo yera'u. What does that mean? Literally means you're going to see my back, but you're not going to see my face. Explains the Khatam Sofer. This is telling us that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is explaining to us. Many times in life we will see only after the fact. But we won't be able to see it at face value. Meaning when we come and we see it face to face. When we are put into that situation. Where we are confronted with a situation right in front of us. We don't understand what's going on. But many times later on. We all of a sudden just click and we say one second. Look what happened. Look how Kadosh Baruch Hu had to come and to put everything so orchestrate, everything so beautifully in order for us to actually understand. Do you know what once happened with a Khatam Sofer? And he explained this with a story that actually happened to him. The Khatam Sofer explains that what happened to him was that he used to stay in a person's house and there was a soldier. The soldier also came and he was staying in this person's house. Because that was the rule of the country that the soldiers had to eat and sleep. So the Khatam Sofer was a Bakhur, and this also soldier was, was, was a soldier in the army. They became friends and they were teaching each other different things that they knew, but they were very good friends. And then each one made off with their lives. Obviously, the Khatam Sofer became a very big rabbi. And this soldier, he didn't know ever anything would happen to him. What happened is, is many, many years later, the Khatam Sofer was accused of falsehood, of different pretenses that they went and they wanted to go against the Khatam Sofer. So what happened was, is the Khatam Sofer, he was taken to court and he was very afraid. When he got into the court, all of a sudden the judge comes and he starts saying to the accusations, no, tell me what's going on. And they start saying he's accused of this and accused of that and accused of this. And then he says, okay, fine, we're going to take a break before we're going to continue. He takes a break 
and the judge calls over the Khatam Sofer. Now the Khatam Sofer is trembling. He doesn't know what's going on, going to happen. Remember that especially in the way of the, where the people where they lived, right? Presbyterian, all these places, they could just do whatever they want. It's like they come and they just put people in jail. They could kill them. They could do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did it. They did it. And then that's it. What are you going to do? How are you going to stop it? And finally, the judge comes and he tells him to the Khatam Sofer, do you recognize me? And the Khatam Sofer is looking at the judge. How am I going to recognize this judge? He looks, says, I, I, don't, I, don't, rem I don't remember. He says, I am that soldier, right? That you always used to be friends with me. And you're always very nice to me. He says, I know you. I know that you are innocent from everything. So don't worry about anything that they're going to tell you. Because I know the truth behind who you really are. The Khatam Sufer comes and he says, look what HaKadosh Baruch Hu had to do. He had to bring a soldier into the house of the Balabait where he was staying to become friends with him. In order that many, many years later, he was going to save him. In order that many, many years later, he was going to be the judge and say that he's innocent and nothing's going to happen. I'll, I'll, I'll bait all the libels and everything that they wanted to go against the Khatam Sofer. Don't worry about it. Hashem has your back. Don't worry. That's what he went and he had to tell him. The Gaon Mevin actually says, so that's what we say in Hudu la Hashem kiru vishmo hodiu va'amim alilotam. What does that mean? We have to thank HaKadosh Baruch Hu when we call his name. We have to let his name known for all his actions. What are we talking about now, the actions that the Basuk is talking about? He says we have to actually come and say thank you to Hashem and also in the nations. He says, but rather it's the chesed agadol, the great kindness that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does with Am Yisrael, that he gives Am Yisrael so many good things that sometimes he gives us good in order to take it away from us. And that in itself is an atonement. What does that mean? Something very, very deep, which I think we should actually understand. Sometimes, HaKadosh Baruch Hu blesses us with incredible blessings. It could be Parnasa, it could be everything. And all of a sudden we come and say to us, wow, look what we have. And after a little bit of time, HaKadosh Baruch Hu takes it away from us. And then we ask the question, but why? What did I do? What did I do wrong? HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you gave me this blessing. But now all of a sudden you took it away from me. What happened? Says the Gaomi Vilna, that in itself is chesed. Because the Kadosh Baruch Hu only gave us that perachar, only gave us that in order to take it away to have an atonement. Which means that beforehand we didn't have what to take away. What are you going to take away? But sometimes he'll give us to us in order to take it away. So we think that when he took it away, he's being unjust. He's, what's going on here? How could God take this away from me? Why? What did I do wrong? And the answer is it's exact opposite. The opposite outlook. He only gave it to us to take it away from us in order to atone for our sins. In order that we should have an atonement. Because now why are we going to ask now, why did he take it away? Ravelia Lopian explains that that's the explanation in the Pasuk in Shira Shirim. We say, HaKadosh Baruch Hu's mashkiach min achalonot. Sometimes, you know, that sometimes nowadays, especially, right, they have these cameras that the cameras actually speak, which means you could have intercom, right, inter voice communication. So all of a sudden, somebody comes in, right, and they don't know that they're being watched. So all of a sudden, you come and say, What do you want? What are you looking for? The guy jumps. Hey, what's, who's talking? What's going on? Come, Chachamim, and they say, Yeah, he's a mashkiach. He's looking out for us. From the windows. But sometimes, sometimes he's looking in between the cracks and crevices. Sometimes he's looking in between the little tiny holes that we can't even see that he's looking at us. What's the difference between the two? Says Ravelia Lopian, the difference between the two is not on the person looking. It's the person that's being watched. Because the one that's looking, he could see you whether he's looking at you through the window or he's looking at you through the crack in the door. Or in the wall, but it's for you. If you are being watched, what happens is, is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when you are looking and he's looking through the window, I could see him in the window. But when he's inside in the cracks and crevices, I cannot see them. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the exact same way. 
sometimes we see Hashem because he's looking at us through the window. So we see Hashem, we have eye contact. And sometimes what happens is, is that he sees us always, but sometimes we cannot actually see him. So what happened once is that there was an incredible story. I apologize if I'm not going to say the story exactly, but the story goes as follows. There was a man that basically during the time of the Holocaust, he was separated from his entire family and he took on to take care of his sister, his younger sister. And what happened was, is that the younger sister, she was basically with the brother and they were the, that's the only ones who they were left. The other ones, they were all perished in the Holocaust. But during the Holocaust, he was taking care of his sister. So he had her in a bunker and he was always taking care of her. And he used to always make sure that she stays in the bunker, right? It was a younger sister and he used to go out and get things. It once happened, right, that all of a sudden, one day he comes back and he's trying to work and trying to find different things and food and everything and bring it back to her. And all of a sudden he comes back and he realizes something different. Something happened. He ran into the bunker, right? And he realized that she wasn't there. He lost it. He went out screaming. Where's my sister? Did anybody see a girl there? Finally, they went and they directed him to the Gestapo office. He went in and he ba ba barged into the Gestapo office. Yeah. And when he went in, right, he barged in, he starts screaming. Where's the girl? Where's my sister? Somebody stole her. They went and they all pulled out their guns to kill him. The main officer that was in the office, he hears all the screaming and everything. He opens up the door and he tells him, wait. He says, come inside. Yeah, come in. So fine. So he comes inside and he starts screaming. I want my sister. The guy, he wants to play a game. He wants to play a game with this Jew. Yeah, so this German Gestapo, this head, this chief, he comes and he says, you know what? I have no problem giving your sister. So he says, a perfect, so hand her over. He says, on one condition, if you have hands on the palm of your hand. So he said, and then you'll let her go. He said, of course. He says, here it is, boom. There was hands on the palm of his hand. There was hair on the palm of his hands. The Gestapo started screaming. He said, get him out of here. Give him a sister and get him out, get him out. Nobody understood what was going on, but listen, he says it, they do it. They, they give it and they get him, they, they, they took off. What happened exactly? The Germans, when they always spoke about that Satan, that Satan was always somebody that has hair on the palm of his hands. So therefore he was looking, yeah, if you're the Satan, then I'll give you back your sister. But what happened with this guy? What happened exactly? How, what? How goes about who made a miracle that hair started growing from the palm of his hands? What happened exactly? So listen to this story. When he was younger, his parents were bakers. And as usual, children are children. So they're running around, jumping around. It once happened that he actually, when he was playing around, he actually put his hand in one of the ovens and it completely burnt the entire skin of his hands in his hand. They rushed him to the hospital and they had to take skin from another part of the body in order to transplant it back. So they had to take it from part of the arm Right from part of, and there what happened was, is that when they planted it back, there was hair that was growing out. For him, and even for, it was embarrassing. You know what it is, a person walking around and every time he shows his hands, it's like, hello, and all of a sudden you have hair. It's embarrassing. He's so many years, he was always embarrassed that he had this hair on his hands. He didn't know why, what, what, what did he do already? But he had it and it was embarrassing. So what happened was, is that for so many years, he was suffering until this day that he realized why Akash Baruch did that. He realized that it was the biggest blessing that he could have in order to save his sister, because that was the only way to save his sister. And Akash Baruch many years before, already planted that seed. And he planted it already there, knowing this is the only way to your survival. And that's how he was able to survive. Him and his sister from the Holocaust, but all in the zechut of the hair that grew on the palm of his hands. And this, in essence, is the story with Rabbi Akiva. We all know that with Rabbi Akiva, what happened? The Gemara Masech Berachot of Samech HaMubet says, Rabbi Akiva was once going on the path. He went into the city and he starts knocking on the door. He wants to sleep. Nobody 
lets him into the houses. Now you could say, listen, even if he wasn't such a big rabbi, somebody comes to a city, there's not one person in the entire, they're not going to let him in. I would, what type of uh, everything. Rabbi Akiva always says one pitgam, one saying, one dictum. Kol ma David Rachmana letavavir. Everything that Akash Baruch Hu does is for the good. And he always says that. And he kept on saying it. So fine. Nobody lets him in. He goes outside of the city. He goes into the forest area. And he has over there the candle, right? The rooster and the lion. Uh, sorry, and the donkey. Yeah. Sorry for giving it over. And what happened was, is that all of a sudden comes, right? The wind turns off the candle. It comes. The cat eats the rooster. Comes the lion. Eats the donkey. On every single one comes Rabbi Akiva. And what does he say? And then what happened? All of a sudden, he continues learning by himself at night in the darkness. What's he supposed to do? Right? He doesn't have anymore the rooster to wake him up in the morning. He doesn't have the donkey to ride upon. He doesn't have the candle anymore. Nothing. What's he going to do? Okay. He accepts it. And all of a sudden, they come. Bandits, he hears a lot of noise from the city. He gets up, he starts looking, and he realizes that they were coming and they were taking over the entire city. And they were taking out everybody as slaves. And they were going to sell them. The entire city was going to be sold as slaves. So what happens? He comes back to his students and he tells them as follows. Do you know that until now, I always used to tell you a theory. I had a thesis, a theory. The theory was, You should know it's not anymore a theory. I lived it and I saw it firsthand. You see that every single detail, if it wasn't for the fact that you had that detail, it was impossible. And therefore I saw how good that it was. And come Chachamim that they say, that in essence, right? He says, this he learned it from Nachum Ishkamzu. His rabbi, because it says that Rabbi Akiva, was Mishamesh Nahum Kamzu for 20 something years, which means he actually learned by Nahum Kamzu for many years. The Gemana Mesech Tanit Kafalev says, What happened by Nahum Kamzu? What happened was is that he was sent as a delegate on behalf of the Jewish nation, right, to go to the, to the king or to the minister, to the chief, to one in, in command. And when he gets there on the way, he stops at an inn. And in the inn, they switched the treasure chest that he had full of diamonds. They switched it for dirt. That's why it was still heavy. But what happened was he gets there and he gives it. And all of a sudden they open it up and they see dirt. So he comes and he says, what? The Jews are making mockery out of me. They're giving me a treasure chest full of dirt. Says, Nahumish Kamzu, Gamzu Letova. This is also for the good. All of a sudden what happens? Eliyahu Navi all of a sudden gets disguised as one of the ministers. And he tells, right, the king, what? You think this is regular? The Jews, they know exactly what it is. This must be the same earth, the same dirt and everything that Abraham, Avram Avinu used. That he used to throw it and he used to change into bows and arrows. The straw used to change into arrows and everything. That's what it was. He says, okay, try it. They tried it and it worked. Ooh, they're able to conquer one city. So they come to him. They say, wow, you gave us such an incredible gift. Whatever you want, here it is. They gave him another treasure to full of it. Right? He goes back and he gets to the inn. They thought that he was going to be dead. Well, you come and you give the, the king. He comes back. They're looking. What, what happened to you? Oh, no, no, no. Something miraculously. Somebody gave me dirt and that dirt happened to be this. They said, what? Dirt? This? Perfect. They went. They took everything. They closed down the hotel, broke it down, took all the earth that they could and they transported everything to the king. Here it is. They tried it. It didn't work. They killed. They were both killed. Say Chachamim. He always used to say Gamzule Tova. The fact that he always used to say Gamzule Tova, that in essence was, was helped him that everything actually became to the best. But there's something actually even a little bit more. What's the difference between Gamzule Tova and Kolma David Rechman al Tavavi? Gamzule Tova means this is also for the good. Kolma David Rechman al Tavavi means everything that Hashem does is for the good. What's the difference? And say Chachamim, listen carefully. The difference is the difference between the two cases. By Nahumish Kamzu, if he would have brought the jewels, it would have been good. So don't think that not only this is good, but even this is good. 
Gamzu Litoba, this is also good. So they're both good. By Rabbi Akiva, it was impossible that it was good. Each order of events had to happen in order to save him. Because if he would have had the rooster, they would have heard him. If he would have had the donkey, they would have heard him. They would have seen him. If he would have had the candle, they would have seen him. In every single one, it was a requirement to get rid of that good that he had in order to be good. So therefore, he says everything that Hashem does was for the good. Because it was impossible to leave any one of them there. It wasn't that it's also good. You had to take it away in order for him to be saved. And that was the difference between the two cases. They say, look at Yosef. Yosef is sold. He's at the top of the world. Yosef is loved by his father, even more by the, by, than the other brothers. He's taught all the different things. He's everything. And all of a sudden, everything becomes black. Everything, his entire, becomes a nightmare. From being on the top of the world, he becomes sold. He goes from one thing, being sold to another one, going to finally becoming a slave. After one year of becoming a slave, and trying to be seduced, being thrown in jail. How many tzarot, how much suffering can a person go through? And a person could always say to themselves, but what did I do already? But why? Why is Hashem doing this? And Kamcha Chamim, they say that no, everything was only just a stepping stone for him to become the Mishneh Lamelech of, of uh, Paro. For him to become the Viceroy, every step of the way was necessary. And therefore, even though it was something negative at the beginning, that's what we think it's so. Now, Kadosh Baruch Hu says Yosef HaTzabik to the brothers, you guys thought it was bad. Elokim chashava letova. HaKadosh Baruch Hu thought it was something good. And therefore, don't worry about it. Because you think it was bad. But it wasn't actually bad. It was actually good. And this is the Imran Shefer brings down in the name of Saba Mikelem. On the way down to Egypt, what were the Arabs carrying? Usually, Arabs always deal with petroleum, right? With gas, with all these things, with oil. What were they carrying? Bissamim, beautiful fragrances, perfumes. Since when do the Arabs deal with perfumes? They deal with uh, petroleum, oil. That's what they deal with, gas, not with the perfumes. But rather, says the Saba Mikelim, that if a person has to suffer in this world, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives the exact measure of suffering and not one iota more, not one ounce, one inch, nothing. And therefore, even though he was going to suffer, he's being sold as a slave. Even within that, HaKadosh Baruch Hu comes and he says, he's not going to suffer more. Why? Because we want him to understand that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is always there with us, even within the suffering. Even within that, Hashem is there. In Kam Chachamim, and they say, explain this Yisod very deep, and they say as follows. Dina, what happened with the story of Dina? Let's just try to analyze what's happening. Imagine right now, right? Leah is pregnant and Rachel is pregnant. Mazal Tov, B'Sha'at Tova, when I order for both of them, they're both pregnant. And all of a sudden, Leah comes and she does a judgment to herself. And she says, how could it be that my sister might have a girl? And if she's going to have a girl, what's going to happen is she's even less than one of the maidservants. It can't be. So what does she do? She judges within herself and they change. She prays and all of a sudden it changes. She has Dina and Rachel has Yosef. Imagine what a kidusha, how much chesed, a girl growing up in the house of a Bet Yaakov, literally, not just a regular Bet Yaakov, in a true house of Yaakov Avinu. And all of a sudden, calamity. She gets violated. She has a child. The child is not going to be accepted in the family. So they have to send the child down to Mitzrayim. And after being sent to Mitzrayim, but what's going on? If you're going to tell me, but why? HaKadosh Baruch Hu, how could you do this? A good Bet Yaakov girl, violated, not, didn't do anything wrong, coming from such a Kiddushav, the house of Yaakov Avinu, from such a Mesiru Nefesh, of so much of giving over, in order that she should actually be able to save the sister from harsh, from, from embarrassment. And you're going to tell me from such a miracle, something so bad is going to happen? But rather, HaKadosh Baruch Hu has a different plan. HaKadosh Baruch Hu needs a wife for Yosef HaTzadik. And that wife, where are you going to find in the middle of Egypt, 
a good woman that's going to be from his own family. So Kadosh Baruch Hu already plants the seeds from the beginning. And Leah, nothing actually bad happened. Menashe and Ephraim, which come from Dina, they come from Dina, which means it also comes from, from Leah. Leah didn't lose. Leah only gained. Because before she was going to have one extra tribe. Now she has another two tribes. Because Menashe and Ephraim, which come from Yosef, even though they come from Rachel, it's joint. They also come from Dina, which comes from Leah. So she never actually ultimately loses. She only gains. And therefore, they say, when we come and we're looking at the story, we could start screaming. And we could start saying, what's going on? It doesn't make sense. But everything, even such a story, makes sense afterwards. It took many years. Because think about it, from the time of the violation until afterwards, it could pass many different years. But it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, what happens is, is they realize what's going on. Later on, they say retroactively, wow, look what HaKadosh Baruch Hu did. And we always thought it was for the negative. But sometimes it takes time in order to realize how positive that it was. But an other interesting note, says the Chavetz Chaim, anything which is actually negative at the beginning finishes with consolation at the end. Meaning at the beginning, it could be very harsh. But at the end, it's always good. Where do you see this Yisod? The Chavetz Chaim speaks in Shminat Alashon Chalek Be'et Perek Yud Aleph. And he says as follows. He says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, right? For example, Yehuda. Yehuda comes and he tears the clothing, right, of Yosef. And then he dips it in the blood. And then because of that, Mida Kineng Mida, he also gets punished. And he says to his father, do you recognize the clothing? So now with him, with Tamar, his daughter-in-law, his two children die of Yehuda. And Tamar, the daughter-in-law, comes and says to her father-in-law, do you recognize who does this belong to? Right? Measure for measure. And then he's embarrassed. But what happens afterwards? Even though he was punished and there was suffering and there was embarrassment, who comes out from that union? It comes out, right? Right? What happens? The Mashiach. The Melech HaMashiach comes out from that. He says, not only from there, you see it with Elimelech and Naomi, Elimelech and Naomi, they were the very, very wealthy people in Eretz Israel. They ran away because of the famine. They didn't want to give Parnassah. They didn't want to give Tzedakah. What happens? They all die. Naomi comes back empty-handed with Ruth. And now she has to receive Tzedakah. Mida kenega mida. Measure for measure. But what happens afterwards? Melech HaMashiach comes from her. Which means that even though at the time they're suffering, and at the time, there's going to be negativity and bad things that are going to happen. Always the end result will always be good things that will happen. And you see that by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that's why HaKadosh Baruch Hu comes and he tells Moshe Rabbeinu. He says to Moshe Rabbeinu, do you know that Geulat Mitzrayim, when I'm going to redeem the, the Jews, it's not going to be easy. But, HaKadosh, but Moshe Rabbeinu comes and he screams at Hashem. He says, Lama Why are you doing bad? To this nation. What are you doing? HaKos Baruch Hu says, what did you say? Now you're not going to see what's going to happen in the future. You're not going to go into Eretz Yisrael. Say, Chachamim, one second. What's the big deal? Moshe Rabbeinu is a, is a ruler. He's the one, the leader of the generation, of the, of the public. He has to demand their, 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 their iniquity. What's going on? He says, HaKos Baruch Hu, why are you making it worse for them? So what? HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, yeah, Abraham and Tav Yaakov. Yeah, but Abraham and Tav Yaakov was a personal level. It wasn't on the level of the entire Am Yisrael. Here, he was, he was claiming against HaKadosh Baruch Hu because of all of Am Yisrael was, was suffering. But rather the answer the Chachamim saying, no. Moshe Rabbeinu had to come to Hashem, yes. It was a terminology that I used. He says, Lama Hareota? Why is it bad? Do you think there's bad in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu? That wasn't bad. The word bad doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. In this world, we look at things and that's why they're bad. And that's why we say Dayana Met, but we don't actually say the words bad. We say he's the, the true judge because everything is going to be true. But in the next world, everything is always going to be atomic. Everything's always going to be for the good because we actually see that it's for the good. Even though here we are confused because we don't see the true picture. But later on, we do see the true picture. And then everything is good. So why was it good? Moshe Rabbeinu thought, he knew that it wasn't going to finish in one minute, but he thought that it was going to become better and better and better, slowly and slowly. 
And what does he see? The exact opposite. The second he speaks to Paro, it becomes 20 times worse. What's going on? HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I need it to become less. Why? 400 years they're supposed to be in Egypt. And I'm doing speedy boarding. I'm doing fast forwarding. How do I do that? Very simple. Make them work harder. Make them work overtime. Now that they're working overtime, now what's going to happen is, is that now they're going to be able to actually come and be able to get out even earlier. But that was all there purposely in order for us to understand what was actually going down. Because down here, it looks like we're doing something bad. But really, there's no such thing as bad. The word bad doesn't exist in his vocabulary. And the Chavetz Chaim actually says that that in essence is what happens between us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Imagine right now you're going to look through the, the little tiny doorknob. There's a little tiny doorknob and there's a little hole. And you look inside and all of a sudden you see that people are cutting somebody up. Right? And the guy is tied down to a bed and they're, they're cutting him up. What would you think? You think, look how cruel. What are these people doing? You want to barge into the room, break down the door and start getting the guy out. What's going on over here? But if somebody would open up the door and all of a sudden you would see that really it's a, it's a, it's a room which is for surgery. And over there you have all the people, they're all with their gloves and they're, all with their, and they're trying to actually save the guy's life. It's something completely different. But why is it like that? Because we don't see the whole picture. We only see and we think that something's cruel being done. And really, we don't realize that only the best things are being done. So, come Chachamim, and they say that in essence is happening with Akadosh Baruch Hu and ourselves. And that's why it says that Akadosh Baruch Hu started and he says, mm-hmm. It starts speaking with him in harsh. And then it says, I tell, I'm going to tell you, I am Hashem. It starts with Elohim and then it finishes with Hashem. It starts with God, the name of justice. It starts with Vaydaber and then it finishes Vayomer, which is of mercy, and Hashem of mercy. What's going on? Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu, sometimes people look at things and it looks that I'm giving justice. It looks that I'm being harsh. And he says, but it's not true. He says that in itself is mercy. Why is that in itself mercy? He says, because it's like HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he's our father. Sometimes a father will come and He'll hug us and he'll kiss us. Sometimes our father will come and he'll hold our hand and he'll help us get through things. Sometimes our father will purposely not help us in order that we become dependent and we start learning how to you know, survive on our own. And sometimes our father will come and he'll give us, right? 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 He'll give it to us. Why? Because sometimes we need it, but it's always for our good. Because we know that he's our father in heaven. He knows that he's our, he's our father. We know that. So therefore, that's the way that we're always supposed to look upon it. To do with HaKadosh Baruch Hu as well. And that's in essence what HaKadosh Baruch Hu always is actually trying to come and trying to teach us. The Chavetz Chaim actually says, right, that when a person, he gave a mashal to a person that comes and they were giving him makot, they were giving him beatings. And a person comes and afterwards, and he's saying to Hashem, why, why am I getting so many makot? Why am I getting so many beatings? And all of a sudden, the king comes and he says, you know what? Any person that was beaten up for every single beating that he, every single beating that he got, we're going to give him a, a money compensation. So every single thing that they got, we're going to pay him for it. And all of a sudden, what happens? You start running and you say, why didn't they give me more? Bring them on. Why bring them on? Because when you realize that you're going to get paid for them, so all of a sudden now it's even worth it. So if people, he says, if only people would understand that for every single type of suffering that a person has in this world, it's going to be taken off of it all and they're going to be paid for it. Instead of actually complaining about them, we would actually even ask for more. Because then we realize how powerful they are and how important they are to our existence and to our survival. And Kamach HaChamim, they actually understand and they say that that's in essence what happened with the Ramban and his student. The Ramban, he once had a student, the Me'am Loez brings us down in Parashat Shofetim, Mahmud Pe'alef. And he says over there an incredible story that the Ramban had a student and he was very, very sad for the student. So he told the student, listen, I want that when you pass, I'm going to give you a certain amulet that with that amulet, you'll be able to go in any different types of gates in heaven. And I want you to find out what exactly happened. 
right? Why did this bad thing happen to you? Right? And he was he was upset. The Ramban was down, Nachmanadis. So he went and the student came to him back in a dream and he told him, you should know that your amulet was able to work in everything that we did. I was able, and you don't know how much they actually appreciate you in Shemaim. But you should know one thing. When I got up to Shemaim, right? There was nothing. There was no questions anymore. All the questions that you were asked were already answered that there's not even a question. There's nothing bad. Everything was going to be for the good. And that's what Chachamim are trying to teach us in this week's parasha. This week's parasha, we are supposed to change our perspective. Kol ma David There's no such thing as something negative. There's no such thing as something bad. Everything is for our best. Sometimes we see it right away. As a Kadosh Baruch who's looking at us like through the window. So we see him right away through the window. Sometimes he's looking through the cracks and crevices. We don't see him. But we know that he's there. And we, as long as we know that he's there, we have to be the happiest people around because we know that it's always our father. And we know that. And that's why we actually have to be proud about it. And we have to be happy. Everything that happens around us, we don't understand. Rav, I once heard this in the name of Rav Amon Yitzhak, I think it was. He says in the olden days, they used to make the women, right? This is talking about in the olden days. Right nowadays, it doesn't even exist anymore. They used to knit. And he says, what happened was, he says, did you ever see that behind when the women would knit, when you look on behind, you don't understand what's going on. It looks like all like all weird. But all of a sudden, when you turn around the picture, it looks like something very, very beautiful, embroidery and everything. So he says, that's the exact same thing that happens in this world. In this world, we're seeing everything from from the back part. Since you're looking at everything from behind, you don't see what's going on. You don't see all the clear picture. It's all puzzled. The only thing that you see is on the front. Bezrat Hashem, after 120, when we go upstairs, we see the clear picture. We see the panim, but we see all of a sudden everything becomes clear why everything had to happen. And that's why we have to thank Hashem for everything that happens. Because obviously, even though now it could be something negative, we know with our emunah shlema that it's going to be something positive. And the same thing happens with this virus. Even though we don't have any clue, and it could be that we want to complain, it destroyed Parnasa, it destroyed social lives, it destroyed the way that we live, it destroyed many, many different things. But we know that Akash Baruch Hu has a master plan, and it's all there, and there's a reason behind every single step in the way. And even though we don't understand what's going on, we have that Emunash Lema that Akash Baruch Hu will always do for the best. Bezerat Hashem, I just hope that we can internalize this message in order to change our perspective. And actually thank HaKadosh Baruch Hu for everything that happens. Shabbat Shalom. Just also to mention that in Shulchan Aruch Siman Resh Lamed, Sif Hey, right, 2.30, it's over, actually written over there, which means a person should always be accustomed to say that everything that Hashem does is also for the best.